Welcome to ESMT Berlin. My name is Molly Eelbrock. As the Director of Corporate Communications here, it's my pleasure to welcome you to ESMT for this economic policy lunch, Reconstructing the Ukrainian Economy, which we are holding together with the Center for Economic Policy Research, CEPR. I would like to thank the colleagues at CEPR for the successful cooperation. It's been a lot of fun working together with the team. The basis of today's event is the first CEPR Rapid Response Economic Series, a blueprint for the reconstruction of Ukraine. We're happy that three of the paper's authors are with us today. Beatrice Veda Di Mauro, president of CPR, Torbjorn Becker, director of the Stockholm Institute of Transition and Economics. They will present the main findings of this blueprint. Timofi Milovanov, president of the Kiev School of Economics, will provide insights from the Lugano Conference, after which there will be ample time for discussions and questions with you. So welcome to everyone in the room. Welcome to everyone who is also online. So um, we will have two of the speakers joining us online. First, it's my pleasure to welcome Lars Hendrik Roger, Professor of Economics at ESMT to set the stage for discussion. Hendrik, the floor is yours. Okay, so let me welcome all of you again uh, to this event and especially also Beatrice um, to have this sort of uh, first joint event CPR ESMT in Berlin on a very important topic. Um, I'm also a CPR fellow actually for the last uh, 30 years uh, and um, in IO industrial organization so I'm very happy being back at ESMT after my spell at the chancery to, um, to bridge a little bit the good economic work which is done at CPR and also with linking it up with ESMT. So we're very happy and very proud to sponsor us. And I think Georg Rochal, the president of ESMT is coming a little bit later and he will join us as well. He's also a member of CPR. So I think that that is uh, very well. Um, so we're gonna be talking about um, the reconstruction plan on Ukraine. And I just wanna say, a few opening remarks um, and then listening very carefully. And I think it'd be nice if we lose the last half hour to have a bit of a debate here. So if you have some questions, we'd be very happy to, um, to, to discuss that. So I think, I guess what one should say, because, you know, talking about a reconstruction plan and this has been, you know, has been um, discussed for a while is that of course, the war is still ongoing, um, that the priority has to be ending the war. It's unclear. And there have been some recent statements by politicians and also, I believe, Ukrainian officials that this war might be going on for a long time. Um, so clearly, you know, doing an economic analysis and knowing something about the cost and very much looking forward to the, to the colleague from Lugano um, talking later about that is somewhat um, a difficult issue. So one of the issues will be, and I know there's an answer and also in the report is, you know, why do we talk about a reconstruction plan now while, um, you know, people are uh, you know, war crimes and an unprovoked war by the Russians uh, is going on. And, and I think one should always, you know, say that upfront that clearly the priority, as far as I'm concerned, is ending the war. And, um, and of course it's unclear what that exactly means. Um, the German chancellor said that, and I think others said this as well, and there's a debate in Germany on that, that Ukraine should not lose this war. Uh, I think that's his formulation. And I think one, one important implication of that is, of course, that whatever you know, stage of the war we're at, um, there needs to be an economic reconstruction plan at the end. So clearly that has to be done well. It's a very complicated issue. Uh, as we will see later on, but I think that's part of the, the story. Ukraine has to not lose and actually be a winner in all of that. And as we know from Germany, you know, reconstructing uh, an economy uh, which is uh, destroyed and uh, war riven um, that can have um, long run positive effects. Of course, you have to do it right and you have to do the governance right. And I think that's also something which people will talk about today. We'll jump into discussing this reconstruction plan and um, you know, looking at it from an economic point of view, even though a lot of that will also be politics uh, and how you actually implement that sort of having been in some of these meetings before, I think that's very important. Um, 
where are we with the reconstruction plan? And here's sort of my two cents worth of that. We've had a G7 meeting last week, and you know, there was that was part of the topic. I wasn't there this time, first time in 10 years. Uh, but reading the communique and talking to people, I think that was an important one. And there's a sentence in the communique that the G7, and that's important because the US is part of the G7. I think the US is going to be key in all of that, if I may say so. Um, that um, you know they are supporting a reconstruction plan in close cooperation with international partners. That was the language, and develop and implement. So the implementation, you know, implementation, implementation, implementation. That's going to be the key to getting anything done. And then we had the Lugano conference, and you probably all heard they had these seven principles. I think um, Beatrice would say something on that. It's interesting. There's a sentence up there which probably they negotiated for a long time. It's a non-binding. Uh, it says non-binding. This is, I don't know if it's there for legal reasons or for political reasons, but I just thought that was interesting. Then the seven principles, I think, make sense. I think they're quite good. Um, the question is now, you know, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, we often say. So how, what, what follows from that? Um, this morning I heard, and um, maybe I'm out of uh, think, that you, the Ukrainian minister also said, you know, there's the UN General Assembly in September, so is, as you want next steps, and they would like some kind of um, resolution from the UN on that. Uh, I think that's uh, that sounds, uh, you know, a good way forward because I think you need to get the US involved. I'm not sure that's a question I would have to Lugano, how strong the involvement of the United States was at Lugano. I would be very interested in hearing more about that. I think in terms of difficult issues, um, I think there are two big issues, which are always big in, in any of these things. The first one is the finances. And there's a, you know estimates about the size of that. Uh, I think the Ukraine yesterday tabled 720 billion euro as the cost, which um, doesn't sound too little. And of course, depends very much on how things will go. Um, the EU has tabled a plan uh, and as always, you know, the EU wants to do something, but actually we need it with the United States. So there'll be quite a bit of, uh, hopefully they coordinate that well. The US put forward a plan through the IP, the European Investment Bank, which of course has an advantage because Russia is not part of it. With IMF and World Bank, that's different. And they were not there, IMF and World Bank, probably for that reason, as far as I know. They put 100 billion down um, and, um, and that's of course not enough. And then there's this big debate uh, on where the money is coming from. You know, that the frozen assets, uh, there are assets of uh, oligarchs um, and um, there might the foreign reserves, uh, which is of course a big issue. And my understanding was that, that, um, that there are, you know, there are economic and legal concerns about confiscating that. The EU is passing a law about a war crime and then it's apparently more possible. I can only imagine how difficult that discussion is from previous discussions. And here we're talking a really big issue. So I think we need to get that right. My two cents worth on the financing is, and it's always there, is leveraging private capital. I think that we need to think about that. I don't know whether companies are represented there. Usually they're not, or they're sort of on the sidelines, but I know that from some of the German companies, and you mentioned Siemens, um, they would of course be you know, ready and interesting to be part of that reconstruction on infrastructure, for example. They built, for example, the Egyptian grid uh, quite well a couple of years ago, and there, I'm sure there are other companies. And there's always a question whose companies are going to get get uh, get the offers. You know, is it um, German, French, American? We need to coordinate all of that. Um, so the private side, I think, is very important in that. So that's one issue on the finances, and the other one is, of course, and Beatrice knows uh, knows a lot about that. Has thought of, or you know, the the authors of, of that report, which I think for me is. One of the more, more important questions is the governance of who actually implements it. I think you're proposing a new institution. You know, that sounds good on paper and you also have a lot of good arguments why that makes more sense. Um, and ideally that is always a good answer, um, but having a new institution also 
uh, may take a long time and uh, there'll be quite a bit of politicking around it and you know, who's who's uh, who has influence on that you know you clearly want it to be independent but clearly the donor companies are going to want to know what happens to their money uh, because it's their taxpayers money was putting this down uh, so it's always a very very difficult situation all these these global governance issues um, and, um, you know, IMF probably can't do it for the reasons. IPE is a European institution, um, so I don't have a good answer to that question either. So maybe we should think about a new institution. And I think one, but then, you know, where and how and what and who decides, and that takes a lot of time, usually. Um, we did this actually, thinking about it during the COVID crisis, we did this ACTA A COVAX institution we did that actually in paris with macron and and the chancellor was there and that was a new institution a multilateral institution to deal with the vaccines and the distribution of vaccines you know but um didn't really work that well because you still had all the other institutions and you know everybody was pushing their national ways and their governance issues so you created a new institution but you need to also give that new institution a lot of power uh, and you know that's uh, that's always difficult in politics but there's there's a lot of pressure and I guess my last point on the new institution and we'll be hearing more about that I'll have an answer to this uh, is that um, because it is so difficult and because it does take a lot of time it's probably worthwhile thinking about it now because I think we need to get even ready that very soon um, and um, you know it should be Ukraine, should call the shots on on many of these things sort of um, you know as a german i feel very strongly about that that we should not impose things and this ownership issue i think is a very important one on the other hand also there need to be reforms in the ukraine i mean i dealt with them 10 years we worked on them with them tried to help them for 10 years you know ended up with a war so obviously didn't end up very well but we try to to work and try to do the reforms and i think this accession to the EU, that might be, I think that's a very important development because that puts them on a path towards reforms, which I think would be necessary for a successful plan. So um, here are some thoughts. Um, and um, so let's uh, hear about the proposal. Again, let me welcome all of you, also the guests who are here virtually. We're much closer to the action than we are here in Berlin. And let me again welcome Beatrice and ask her to give us her thoughts. Thank you. You have to, thank you. Thank you very much, Lars Henrik, and for ESMT for uh, having us. It's, um, it is a pleasure to be back in Berlin. Um, and uh, it is also a pleasure because, and this has already been alluded to, we are planning to do more together between the ESMT and the CEPR in the not too distant future. And so in that sense, this is also a first uh, joint luncheon briefing. Um, uh, we hope that there will be more. Um, so I am going to, and in fact, you has, have already done quite a bit of presentation and uh, discussion of the report. So I'm going to go through it relatively quickly um, and then also focus on what is new since then. But a few words on, maybe can I have it on that screen so I can see? Um, so a few words on where this came from and how, how rapidly it happened. You see, we have a long uh, list of co-authors here, and they are across many different um, time zones. Uh, two of them uh, will be presenting after me, um, uh, Toby and Timothy. Uh, but one person I need to, uh, need to call out is, where do I point? is uh, Yuri uh, Gorodnyshenko, who is a Ukrainian national uh, teaching macroeconomics in Berkeley. And he was very much uh, in the lead for this report. And um, the second thing I want to call out is the rapid response economics number one, uh, because we actually put this together in a very few, uh, in a very, very short time. 
uh, this was uh, in mid-March when still, you know, the war was new. We were all still under the shock of the war. We are now kind of getting used to the fact that there is a war in Europe, but um, but but uh, starting to think about, and, and in fact, uh, some of the courses also here, like uh, Barry Eichengreen, who has done a lot of work on the Marshall Plan, was saying, you know, Marshall Plan type thinking is what needs to be brought to this. And yes, Marshall Plan also started reconstruction even before there was peace everywhere. So, uh, so we start by saying, okay, there will be different phases of reconstruction. Some of it is the purely emergency response uh, to this disaster and the destruction. The other is the rapid restoration of infrastructure and services. And then at the same time, however, this needs to be coordinated within a plan that lays the foundation for future growth and modernization. So these phases uh, need to be thought of in, uh, in, in sync with each other. And that of course is also something that came out now in the Milano conferences saying we need a vision for where, uh, where the reconstruction should be leading. And then we established that these are not the same principles as a Milano, but uh, Lugano, but um, they are very uh, similar. And in fact, we are happy that we seem to have at least partly inspired uh, uh, the principles. I'm going to go through them as they are in the blueprint, and they refer mostly to the economics of the of the needs here, but um, the economics and governance. So the first principle is international aid, and we're talking here about massive international aid that will be necessary, uh, needs to be effective. And we have, in fact, a lot of experience and a lot of research um, about into the question how to make aid uh, effective or ineffective. So the effective is important here. And then the second point that is important that we said it needs to be quick, it needs to be front loaded for obvious reasons, but conditional. And that is also something that we thought was very important as a message from the beginning. This is not unconditional. It cannot be unconditional aid. Speed front loading, yes, is critical, but reasonable conditionality, accountability, milestones, and ways to make sure that we see the progress, including on the governance and corruption fighting uh, are important um, important preconditions for effective international, for the, the effective deployment of resources. And the second very important condition in still to make this effective is that it should be mostly grants, not loans. Um, the historical precedent here with the Marshall Plan is that 90% of Marshall Plan was in fact grants. And we already know um, that debt sustainability is going to be an issue in the Ukraine. So, you know, giving loans in a situation where sustainability is not uh, assured um, is just making the problem bigger. So uh, it will mean that some kind of debt restructuring happens further down the line. Therefore, loans is not the right answer in principle. Then donor coordination this is not just the coordination in terms of what where do you want to go but there are going to be in this case many many different sources of funds it will have to be many different sources of funds and men, some of them may even be private but most of it is likely to need to be public so a multitude of aid sources requires close coordination across funding sources uh, we know this from <laughs> years, decades of experience when countries face many donors, bilateral and multilateral, that um, that is one of the preconditions for making aid ineffective. You actually get even donor competition very often for the good projects, etc. This needs to be avoided. We want to minimize waste and delays. And this is where it comes. This is one important reason why you want to have a agency that does this coordination and and does the and, and, and does the, the the essentially the uh, um, sort of the channeling um, of the of resources it should be independent in our view but of course account uh, accountable and um, it should be a self-standing and in our view EU affiliated or authorized uh, agency and yes, 
Uh, it's never easy to do these things, um, uh, Henrik, but it is uh, also absolutely necessary. If we are going to be channeling large scale resources, it is absolutely necessary that the, 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 this channeling uh, is happening through, a, uh, through an agency that has the, the, the power and the accountability to make it work. Again, Marshall Plan here stands um, uh, party. Uh, the, the Marshall Plan was such an agency and did deliver coordination, effectiveness, and ultimately size. What is very important also at the same time is ownership. This cannot be an agency that is sort of, you know, <laughs> doing the, the, its own thing. And it can also not be just the mouthpiece of donors. Ownership from the side of the Ukrainian government is absolutely crucial. So again, we know aid does not work unless there is ownership on the receiving side. So the Ukrainian government will have to set the ultimate objectives, will have to identify the, uh, the source, the, the, the projects, and will also need to make sure that this is sustainable even after aid eventually is withdrawn and reconstruction uh, is, uh, is, is uh, completed. And this is why, ultimately, this is why the EU as accession anchor is, plays such an important role in our um, EU accession as an anchor for this whole process plays such an important role in our thinking. Um, EU accession comes with a lot of uh, preconditions, is a path that is well defined, and therefore can align the thinking and the regulatory environment uh, towards EU standards, can bring an anchor uh, in the future, and including can be work work uh, well for uh, addressing governance and corruption questions. In addition, it promotes free trade, attracts foreign investment, and should you know, bring the long run stability of a process. The most important, uh, and I think this is also again, something that was uh, emphasized by our co-authors who studied the Mar Marshall Plan, the Marshall Plan's impact um, was only partially the money itself. Very important was that it was a framework that provided confidence to private investors that Europe would be a market economy and was on a, a, a particular path. So here again, this is where we think this EU accession plan can provide a similar, a similar uh, uh, anchor. Modernization here, it's, this is the fun part. This is about, you know, thinking new. This is about uh, um, smarter cities. This is about green infrastructure, digitalization, but also education. Here is where, um, uh, where, where it's about creating new opportunities and also attractive conditions for displaced Ukrainians who uh, return home. Um, you know, having lived in Singapore for many years now, smart cities, beautiful green cities, and thinking about them in a holistic manner is clearly a part of the Singapore uh, uh, success uh, story. Uh, so some of this can be uh, brought uh, to, or should be brought to the reconstruction of the Ukraine. Governance and uh, corruption, I will not go too much into this in order not to crowd out uh, uh, Toby, who is, I think, uh, standing by. Um, but it is important, it's a very important part of the, of the story that we need to be able to, uh, uh, to have the confidence and to scale up the size of resources needed. The donors have to have the confidence that they will be used well. And then the cost. Well, in our blueprint, and remember this is mid-March, we were already looking, by looking at previous examples of reconstruction, but also at already the destruction that had happened, we already had a, um, a, a uh, range of, uh, of uh, costs that was up to uh, 500 billion euro. Now Lugano 720 to uh, 50 uh, euro. So, you know, within two months, uh, quite an additional um, uh, tab. Um, here is what the EU is uh, putting together 
you know, uh, in a highly concessional, this is a loan, by the way, but it's highly concessional. So 10 billion, and it's not easy. It's not easy to, to, to put this together. Um, so, and for Memoria, the grand component of the next generation EU, and that is something that was super difficult to organize and was distributed among those who were sitting at the table, was only 360 uh, billion grants. Yeah, the rest is, is loans again. Um, so, so we are talking about really, really big numbers. And therefore, the financing gap right now is enormous. And I have not heard any, you know, really strong commitments from Lugano, right? We hear about principles, but not uh, know how the financing gap is being closed. Clearly, then people talk about what about the Russian central bank reserves that are frozen? What about the frozen assets uh, that uh, can they be seized of the of the blacklisted uh, Russians. Um, high estimates here are in the area of 50 billion. And there is also an alternative proposal out there that a tariff on Russian oil might be in part used in order to uh, do some reconstruction uh, of the Ukraine. So, so those are, those are uh, floating ideas, uh, sort of, they are, very much bucked down into, especially when it comes to the private assets, into legal. We cannot do this for many reasons, apparently. So, in the the truth is that I don't see that we are uh, that that there is much movement <laughs> right here. Uh, and even um, you know, when you look at the the central bank's reserves, uh, you know, well, it's something like. 150 to 200, which is accessible. This is from the Economist. Uh, doesn't come from our blueprint. It, um, this is where and where they are actually frozen right now. There are a lot of it is in Germany. And finally, what do I want to say is, you know, what has changed since we wrote this blueprint? Which, by the way, you can uh, download from the CEPR website. Uh, I'm I'm just giving here a, a quick run through it. Um, well, on the one hand side, we have already seen the cost to the Ukraine is much, much higher. Fiscal costs, the direct cost is higher. The direct fiscal costs are now being estimated at 5 billion per month of uh, financing the war and increased expenditures. Um, but also on the macro side, by now the inflation rate in the Ukraine is 18% and they've had to increase their interest rates is now at 25%. And by the way, you have a fixed exchange rate. So that is clearly a macro imbalance that eventually, uh, you know, in a war economy, what you what partly is happening here is that there is monetary financing of this deficit. Uh, it will not, again, when the war is over, things will have to adjust. So very likely the Ukraine is coming out then with a highly overvalued exchange rate and a very high level of debt. We also see that the, the costs on the side of Europe are higher than you know, in March. Uh, gas prices at 150, which feed directly into electricity prices all over Europe, not only in the countries that are using the gas and storing it. Uh, a large part of the inflation um, that we are seeing is uh, due to this higher energy prices. And the fear of recession from the possibility that uh, that actually uh, the, the gas um, and other energy resources may fail in the winter is, uh, is, is increasing. So we have higher interest rates, faster increasing interest rates, partly in, in, as a consequence of the way that we are not implementing any uh, uh, sanctions on the on the or the way that we are actually doing the sanctions by essentially buying at any price. Uh, and it also results in less fiscal space on the side of Europe. So the announced oil embargo on Russian oil, uh, it has announced that you will um, uh, uh, buy, not buy anymore in the future. In the meantime, however, uh, prices go up. So again, um, the windfall uh, for Russia has been significant. Uh, the ruble, as you know, has appreciated. We have they have very strong fiscal revenues uh, from the energy exports. So Russia is, ex is exerting uh, uh, market power, but the EU is not right now. We are just paying. Um, 
So the only, so all of those are negative compared to what, you know, two months ago um, in, in terms of the costs, both on both sides. Um, but the costs for Russia are not as large as, uh, as, as one could have expected. The only positive that has actually happened is that Ukraine is now uh, officially a new uh, accession candidate. So that part of the of our, uh, you know, very important pillar of our reconstruction ideas um, uh, is, uh, is, is uh, uh, happening or is, is already uh, decided. So let me start here, uh, stop here. <laughs> um, winter is coming. That is, that's, that is something that you can say for sure. Right now we are flying into summer holidays, but winter is coming and it's not looking good. It's not looking good on both sides. Um, so, Toby, are you there? You're next. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> yes, I'm absolutely here. Um, not able to fly into Berlin, though, for this occasion. And I'm, I'm very happy, though, that I could connect online and, and be part of this discussion this way. Um, and I just have to reiterate that you know, my part of this report compared to Yuri's and, and others is, is really minor, but I'm, I'm still very much in favor of all of the recommendations of this report. And, and Beatrice asked me to talk a bit about uh, corruption and governance. Um, and I think we all understand that this really is a key issue. Um, I think maybe for those that don't work on, on the Ukrainian economy on a daily basis, it, it, it may be worth to just remind us here, what was the whole GDP of Ukraine before the war actually started? And that number is maybe surprising to some of you, but it, it was actually less than $200 billion. Uh, that, that was sort of the market value of, of all of GDP for Ukraine for 2021. So when we're talking about reconstruction plans that would amount to several hundreds of billions of dollars, so that becomes multiples of the whole economy of Ukraine before the war. We understand that we really need to think hard about how to use those funds uh, in the best way. And, and when we think about the best way, it's, it's easy when we start to talk about corruption to think that the biggest issue is for, for taxpayers in, in Sweden, where I am, or in Germany, or in the EU in general, or in the US. But I mean, of course, the biggest price people pay for, for not dealing with corruption in, in this reconstruction would be the taxpayers and people of Ukraine. So I think that perspective is important to, to bring along to the discussion. Uh, I also want to stress that when, when we think about uh, corruption, a lot of people bring up immediately Afghanistan as sort of a, a very strong example of where things did not go well when we, we put a lot of money into reconstruction. Um, but they sort of forget some of the successful cases in the Marshall Plan, which is again important that we remind ourselves about. And, and one example that we point out in the report is that Italy actually had quite significant problems with corruption and still was a successful case of reconstruction within the Marshall Plan. Uh, and now if we turn to what, what's going on uh, in Ukraine, I think it's also key to remember that in, in Afghanistan and a lot of these other countries where you did not see so good progress from reconstruction, there was a significant democratic deficit. There were countries that were still very fragmented politically and, and within different interest groups in the countries. And I think Russia has really provided Ukraine an opportunity to unite uh, around the common cause here with the war. We see this quite strongly that uh, also people that may not have been you know, on the same side, they share the view that re reconstructing Ukraine should be to the benefit of, of the whole country uh, and, and all of the population in there. So I'd, Linking it to these democratic processes in Ukraine is, of course, going to be key. Um, on top of that, I also think that a lot of people would not be aware of the fact that Ukraine did make good progress on, on developing procurement systems when it was dealing with, with the COVID pandemic. It was actually setting up quite novel uh, ways of doing procurement in an emergency situation. 
Um, for example, they had things like open contracting. So when you get the contract, the process may be quick and much quicker than usual because it's an emergency you're dealing with. But once you get a contract, you need to publish the details of these contracts online within a very short time period. And then after these contracts have, have been fulfilled, you can also go back and evaluate if the contracts were actually followed. And this is something that Ukraine was actually uh, dealing with. Um, the other thing that I think uh, we should think about when it comes to, to dealing with corruption is, is whistleblowers and protecting whistleblowers. Um, there will be a lot of people in Ukraine that will have very limited sort of patience with corruption. So, I mean, there will be plenty of people that would be ready and willing to report misuse of funds uh, in the reconstruction of, of Ukraine. But in that process, of course, it's important that th those same people uh, are protected. And, and I mean, in some countries, whistleblowers are even rewarded for reporting uh, corruption and, and misuse of funds. Uh, and then there are other technical things like this that, that Ukraine um, can introduce. But again, I think we need to have a little bit uh, a leap of faith here and, and not just think about all the problems of, of Ukraine's past when it comes to corruption. It is an extremely important uh, topic. And, and one of the Lugano principles, number three, is exactly about transparency, accountability, and the rule of law. Uh, but, but on the other side, the Ukrainian uh, group that is, is looking at, at uh, the recovery plan, the National Council for the Recovery of Ukraine, uh, they also have a, a working group dealing with anti-corruption policies, and, and they already have out a paper with uh, quite a few uh, recommendations on how to improve on, on the corruption and anti-corruption framework uh, for Ukraine. So I think we, we need to understand that this is a very important question, but we also have to remember that Ukraine has made progress. They are extremely well aware of, of this fact. And also that the mindset of people in Ukraine really has changed uh, because of the war and what is going on here. So I think there are some more positive things than what you had on your slide, maybe Beatrice. Uh, and, and uh, you know, sitting up here also, I think providing security for Ukraine, as you said, uh, is also, of course, going to be extremely important. You know that my country in Finland, Sweden and Finland have applied to NATO to get sort of increased security up here. But, but of course, that, that also has to be part, part of the plan. So making people, you know, secure and safe, not only from corruption, but of course, from a continued sort of assault from Russia uh, to get sort of the private sector involved in Ukraine. So protecting funds from, from all sorts of practical angles will be important here in, in the reconstruction. And again, just, just to state the obvious, enormous <coughs> amounts of money will need to be raised. And I think it's very, very important to stress what, what Beatrice said, that governance really need to focus on donor coordination in, in this process. And, and I think uh, I also agree, uh, Lars Henrik, that it's, it's difficult to set up new institutions, but I also spend quite a few years of my life working for the IMF. And, and it is quite clear that the IMF or other institutions like that are a bit too far away from, from Ukraine to be the meaningful coordinator. Uh, and I also think that this idea of connecting it to EU is really vital because the long term sort of prosperity and growth of Ukraine is going to be vitally, uh, very strongly linked, I mean, to, to the development of, of the EU accession process. So, but I'll, I'll stop there because I think most of us are interested to hear what Timofe has to share from, from the Lugano meeting. So thank you for now. Thank you very much, Toby. Um, I, uh, I, I hope you can stay online in case there are questions later for you also. Um, Timothy, do we have you? 
Yes, um, I'm here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's wonderful. Uh, you can see us. We cannot. Yes, yes, I, I, I can yes, see. Yes, we can see you. We can see you. Um, well, thank you very much for for um, doing this and for sharing uh, what what's new on your side. So yeah, so you know, it's uh, I'm on the way back from Lugano to to Kiev, and it's now has been a challenge. And as everything else uh, is during the war times, is a challenge. But just to to put it in a context, it used to be two three hours to get to Europe from Kiev, and now it's forty eight hours. Uh, the conference was over. We left at four thirty p.m. yesterday. We're still traveling. We're halfway between Warsaw and Helm and will be in Kiev only tomorrow. So this, this is the kind of logistical challenges we are facing when we're traveling ourselves. Imagine what kind of challenges there will be with any kind of reconstruction uh, under this environment, you know, just to get something to Ukraine, uh, to get it done there and, uh, in the, under the war conditions is, is uh, extremely challenging, it's a nightmare. Um, and yet this is needed now, uh, because if uh, Ukraine is not being supported uh, right now, um, you know, the construction will be costlier. We, we have seen the number go up from 200, 500 billion euros total losses to 750 just over the last two months, and the toll will go up. So, you know, uh, I agree with all the principles that uh, have been discussed and uh, the issues, and I, I'm going to outline a couple of impressions from Lugano. I spent there two days and talked to many people, both, um, you know, I had the opportunity to moderate the economic recovery panel, as well as talk to many people outside of uh, the formal uh, forum, you know, it's kind of, um, you know, behind the doors. And I think um, the major issue which comes down is coordination. Uh, everyone is pushing their agenda a little bit. There is uh, some conflicts between the US, UK and the EU perspectives, although people are very diplomatic about this, but you know, there's, there's clearly maneuvering for the leadership on this. Um, there are disagreements about uh, commitments. Some countries can be, you know, are thinking about committing billions of euros. Others are talking about, you know, uh, embarrassingly small amounts, like someone offered a commitment of 10 million euros yesterday. Uh, which uh, was almost insulting to some of the Ukrainian audience because the cost of the conference was higher than that. Um, so, so there's this, this question about how to coordinate um, whose taxpayers pay how much and uh, what is the timeline. Then there is this friction between the IFIs. It's, it's very, very visible behind the doors uh, where you know just the, the IFIs are jealous. For example, European Investment Bank came up with a facility um, and at the same time, the World Bank and the IMF have opinions about the specific uh, officers, have the specific views, and they're not very shy about these views when there are no mics around. So all that uh, is threatening um, the efficiency. So there is a real risk of uh, making this process really dysfunctional. So in that sense, coordination is needed. I was hoping to hear some language about the um, about the Joint Secretariat or something, you know, not necessarily a formal agency, but at least a process, uh, the start of the process where there'll be a body, there'll be people, you know, there'll be people responsible for moving it forward. And uh, my understanding is that people have not been able to agree on this as well, even on this. And so that has been explicitly discussed. So I'm, I'm a little bit negative, but I'm trying to drive home the point that coordination is going to be the major impediment. The goodwill is there. The sense of urgency is there. A lot of people were talking about the fact that reconstruction has to be happening now. You know, there's a little bit this eerie feeling that uh, the war is raging, people are dying by day, uh, and yet we're talking about billions or hundreds of billions of dollars reconstruction and EU accession. And it's a little bit detached, but that wasn't the case. Uh, everyone, everyone at the panels, at the discussions was saying, listen, you know, we are really talking about a continuous process, uh, the process which right now, uh, focuses on what's needed during the war, and then after the war, um, focuses on modernization and leapfrogging. So those um, the people there is a lot of awareness uh, about the war. You know, the second concern was uh, crowding out the private sector because all the discussions are about G to G, government to government, and you know people explicitly were saying that we need to leverage uh, the private sector. We discussed it today, right in the very beginning. 
at the opening remarks, but also yesterday, I think the IFC was very explicit uh, about the need to bring the private sector. Then there's another concern about um, the coordination at the central versus local government levels. Is it all the central government will be doing? So will it undo the decentralization reform de facto? Uh, so the concerns like that. And the <laughs> overreaching the governance issue, corruption, but also who gets the contracts. Uh, again, we also talked about this in the beginning of today's discussion, but uh, it also is very, very visible in the air that different countries and different industries uh, have different expectations about their part. You know, Some people are almost explicitly saying that, listen, we contributed a lot in terms of weapons, while other countries are not really picking up the bill. But then maybe we have a bigger, bigger, uh, bigger pie, bigger, uh, bigger share, bigger chance to, uh, or maybe we deserve contracts, you know, and at the same time, the Ukrainian side wants to get the contracts too, because we need jobs. So that will be another potential friction. So all of that speaks to the real need about clarity and very formal uh, and efficient structure of coordination. Because if we don't get it right, I think uh, what the process will unravel. And I think that's, that's I think, I guess the main, my, the main lesson. The willingness is there, the potential is there, the details of the process will matter. All right, thank you very much. That was a very uh, sobering, but also uh, insightful um, uh, view from uh, the Lugano and the process. Um, is, are you going to moderate? I'm going to moderate. Excellent, why don't you do it? <laughs> um, well, thanks, thanks for that. Um, we have about um, something like half an hour. I have a couple of remarks on what we've just heard, um, and um, and then I'd like to maybe also at some point go to the floor if you'd like to ask a question. So, so what I've been, am I on the microphone? I guess so. So I think you know, uh, Timothy, very very pertinent your remarks about coordination, and I think this is always the big issue we've been having on these global issues. Um, and a lot of goodwill being there. I think that's very important. And the question is really now, you know, even I'm not part of the process, is sort of how do you translate that goodwill? Can you hear me? I'm not sure you can hear me, but it's okay. Can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you, uh, but I lost last of the half of the sentence. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, okay. <laughs> I, my, my question is sort of uh, what I hear from you is there's a lot of goodwill. There's always this coordination issue with the EPs, and I think it's it's um, it's it's always there. Also, the leveraging of the private sector, that also is a coordination issue, by the way. So my my and the corruption issues obviously are key in how we do that. I think we have a lot of good suggestions and principles. The question really is, who's taking the lead now in terms of implementing that? Um, and um, because of all this coordination issue, which is really very important. And my, my thoughts are, you know, if, for example, the G7, um, you know, uh, I don't know whether there's been a discussion on how to take this forward, uh, but if the G7 who have actually said they would take, uh, they would support it. They've also, by the way, just passed this big infrastructure program, this, this um, you know, this PGII, which we did already last year under the British presidency. And I had suggested, in fact, last year to use Ukraine as a country to use this, and we didn't discuss it with the president over, over dinner with the chancellor, as a case country to, to implement this. And it's all about coordination. It's all these countries doing their thing. Um, so if, you know, one possibility is the G7 takes it forward. Um, and next year's G7, by the way, is Japan, because it's not going to be something just for this year. So Japan is a nice country also. Um, so that's one idea. The other obvious one where we done in health, you know, we did the ACTA A COVAX was the G20. So the G20 created a new institution, but that won't work here no. um, for obvious reasons. Um, um, and then there's the UN. So, so my question really is to what extent, you know, is there a sense of you know, how do we take this forward now? Now we had a nice conference, we had these principles, you know, um, we, so then the second remark is on this graph.
Hello? Yeah. Can we hear you? Okay, uh, because the connection is really bad. Uh, but uh, let me see if I can... Let me reconnect. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we hear you. Oh, okay, great. And I can see you and hear you now. Great. So I'll, um, so in this coordination, I'll just uh, give a remark. I think G7 is the most likely candidate because, uh, um, okay, so the World Bank, the IMF, and uh, the IFIs more generally, uh, you know, I don't, uh, well, the IMF was there and uh, they are willing to do, but there are obviously these issues with the shareholders and therefore there'll be an issue of credibility. The World Bank is very sensitive. Uh, it, uh, you know, you can, you can really touch it almost, you know, how, how jealous they are about this issue. Uh, I, I don't want to, you know, escalate it too much, but uh, they were very, very explicit. So, so I don't think IFIs will be, they will be fighting a little bit. G7, uh, you know, there's even this um, lovely episode where someone from the EU Commission said, oh, you know, because we, we talked to your vice prime minister and we said, uh, you agreed that uh, uh, we're going to coordinate everything. And uh, the prime minister says, what? And everyone else says, what? And it was almost, you know, like they explicitly said they're disagreeing. Then the UK, uh, I talked to some people from the UK and they want to be in the lead together with the US. So, you know, G7 might be, and some people are saying that the most likely it is going to work out uh, through G7. So I think that's, that's, a, that's one way to, uh, to take it forward. And the second one, I think, is that uh, Ukraine has a lot of soft power in terms of formal uh, uh, kind of shaping this process. Because right now, uh, to make... Uh, anything you know actionable uh ukraine has the opportunity to keep reaching out uh, bilaterally and uh through uh, different uh institutions to partners and uh um you know suggesting specific next steps you know uh, from immediate financing and immediate projects to different governance much depends on on, on ukraine and the ukrainian government uh, has a, you know is pretty aware of this and uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs will try to, to shape this process. So, you know, if I were to recommend something to, you know, to an abstract audience, I would say, let's get in touch with Kuleba, uh, with the Foreign Minister of Ukraine, and see about, uh, see about the specific next steps and maybe try to formalize this process through the diplomatic channels. And I think that uh, then it might be happening. But if the draw, you know, if Ukraine drops the ball right now and uh, just waits and sits for someone to come forward with some coordination agency, it will just delay things and it's not clear what will happen. So Ukraine has to take the ownership right now, even in terms of uh, uh, nudging very, very gently, very diplomatically, but nudging uh, the international community and partners to... Yeah. That would be my suggestion. Yeah, no, I think that's very interesting. If you say G7, because Germany is still in the presidency, so Berlin also will have to play some role here. Uh, be, you know, we we'll, we'll should try to encourage that as much as we can from over here. Um, Paul Bjorn. Thank you. I'm, I'm still a little bit uh, skeptical about the G7 versus the EU, though. I mean, I, I don't think the G7 has the same clear sort of reform path that, that is connected to EU accession. Uh, so, it, I mean, I understand that there's going to be a lot of politics around it, but I cannot see how we're not connecting this much more clearly to some sort of EU institution. Of course, with, with close collaboration with the US, with the UK, Japan, etc., that's, that's obvious, but, you know, it, it, it's a bit like with the IMF. The IMF goes in and cleans up the mess, but it doesn't really have the... 20 year perspective of, of you know Ukraine doing something particular with the IMF and, and and neither does the G7 so I mean I just think that this is such a long-term process 
and the only really, really long-term player involved in this game, uh, in my mind, is the EU. So from that perspective, I think it really needs to get back to the EU. And I, I already think van der Leyen had this idea of creating a platform and inviting everyone to join, etc. And I, I think, to me, that would be the best the starting point of this process. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to second um, that thought that this is a very long term uh, uh, engagement that needs to happen on both sides. And um, yeah, if, if I have recently um, reread the book uh, Prisoners of Geography, I don't know if you have a uh, if you know this, um, but it is really worth uh, a book looking at, which is essentially claims that you can see a lot of the geopolitics from just looking at maps. And the central map in this context here and the central uh, geographical uh, feature is the Northern European plain, which happens to go from France to all the way to the Ural mountains. And it's plain, you know, and and they, and you can drive an army through, and it goes from from Paris to Moscow, and you know, Ukraine is very much in the middle, and so by the way is Berlin. So the the, the geographical feature that connects this these countries is a very strong ultimate um, connection that's not going to go away, <laughs> and therefore, I, from a from a different perspective, yes, the long run uh, the long run perspective has to be Europe, and therefore, I would also second very much. We need to leverage the European process as much as possible and stop as quickly as possible what, uh, what Timothy has been describing, this jealousy thing is like, you know, I want to be the one here and my companies and so on. I mean, that is really, is really sad. Yeah, I'm, I'm always a G7 guy and less of an EU guy uh, over the years, um, but I take your point that it might be uh, better to go with the EU. The EU has also all kinds of issues, by the way coordination issues, which are not easy to do. Um, and I, you know, I think the thing which speaks for G7, if they can cut the mustard, is that um, if you want to create something new, um, it might be easier if you use the G7. Um, the EU is usually also stuck in its structures, which is of course an advantage because it has a long run perspective. But I don't know the answer, but I think, you know, um, the, um, Timoth Timothy, Sorry, and then if once somebody wants to ask a question, I think to take that. Yes. Yeah, so, 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 so I think the key is to understand the difference between the immediate ability to provide relief right now, and maybe that uh, the US, uh, the UK, and the European countries could uh, coordinate here more. With the, while the long run perspective, this uh, political gravity pool is really coming from the EU. So these things are not contradictory. I'm not sure if it's possible to do the you know, kind of two-stage approach, but when I was talking about G7, I was reflecting to the realities that they've seen on the ground that everyone is, you know, uh, Americans are saying, listen, we're gonna put money down. British were very, very explicit about, you know, what they think uh, uh, about the ability of the EU to move forward, but in the longer, uh, quickly, but in the longer run, uh, but in the longer run, I think uh, the political process is going to favor the accession. The, you know, when we start talking about the sustainability, and we're going to talk, in, we're going to be talking about ten years effort. You know, maybe even more. Uh, then that's the UN curve, right? Uh, and so these things have to be designed appropriately. So I, I, I think they should be careful thinking about how to start process to make it functional right now. Uh, well, while in the end, I think it will be the, it will be the EU accession, which will be the sustainability driver. One more question, Yuri. Are you personally involved in this? Not Yuri. Sorry, that's my no. Tim, Timothy. Are you personally involved in this? Your institute? Well, we uh, we are trying not to be at the forefront. Uh, what, what we're trying to do is to provide uh, analytical support and we do share our opinions and a lot of our analysts, uh, many of them was with, uh, with me in this car. Uh, at the same time, we are involved, we, we, are, we, are, being, we are discussing, we are, we're quite sharing our opinions, but um, 
we do not have a formal position, but, but we, you know, even today we talk to a number of members of the government about how things should be. Um, so again, I, I'm rising, I'm raising the awareness about this uh, within the Ukrainian government about this uh, frictions and this functionality which is coming up. Uh, we're trying to overcome it, finds the way, but, but in that way we are involved, yes. Yeah, more power to you. Good luck. Um, I mean, in a positive way. I mean. <laughs> Uh, any other questions here? Yes, Molly. Thanks, Molly. Yeah, please, please use the uh, microphone for those at home or somewhere else in the office. Thank you. Um, so first of all, thank you uh, for for this uh, today's session. So I'm uh, my name is Marcus Hein. I work at the Federal Foreign Office here, um, just across the river, um, and I work in the International Financial and Economics Division, and I also handle G7 actually. So I. Uh, 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 provided some input last year and also this year with the resilient democracy statement I also worked on the communique so I'm very familiar with this and that's uh, one of my first comments because we have limited time I'll make it quick uh, so one observation I'd like to share on how to marry the G7 and the EU perspective perhaps is that the G7 serves as an impulse giver which they have done so in the past with for example minimum taxation which was then something taken forward by the G20 later in the year and so I think the G7 are a suitable format to take things very quickly flexibly and with a high degree of unity something that the eu does not always have but then is for the longer term perspective and then i wanted to share a second observation uh, which is that uh, during the reconstruction of germany in 1948 there was a currency reform uh, that did a lot to quickly move a war ravaged uh, economy with uh, little supply of goods to a fully well, more or less fully functioning more flexible economy full of goods and there are many germans uh, who witnessed that who will say that from one day to the next there were many many goods back in the stores that weren't there before and that uh, the background behind that is different exchange rates in the currency reform for uh, companies versus individuals um, so that's something to be taken in, into account as well that's one reason why that worked so sometimes the solutions are not always solutions that are socially so acceptable maybe but that have to be considered nonetheless um, and then one of my uh, my last point is more of a question maybe to to everybody to the floor as well, uh, which is the geopolitical reasoning behind reconstruction so that's something that hasn't been talked about yet. But it's something that I think is really crucial um, to get other actors on board as well, and to also solve this coordination issue a little bit to have one common narrative on what is our reasoning in the West, maybe between the G7, but also for the EU to aid in the reconstruction of the Ukrainian economy. How does it benefit us in a way as well, talking not strictly in a transactional term, but also in terms of giving them a perspective? Uh, and how does that aid us in our geopolitical standing as well, which is, I think, a very difficult one right now when we look at countries like Indonesia, India, South Africa, Argentina, the BRICS summit. Um, so I think those are things maybe from a G7 perspective I would like to share as well. And with that. Thank you for your it was really comments uh, and uh, keep up the good work in the foreign ministry because, um, you know, we are driving the G7 process from within and that's very important as we just heard. Um, we can take another one. There's, yeah, <laughs> Actually, I, I would have uh, would have liked to ask a question. So we we just heard about the squeezing out of private investment, also the potential risk of squeezing out of uh, private investments, um, and I, I would just like to uh, uh, ask more about this. So, um, in in your view, what would be the right format to actually bring public and private investments uh, together um, in terms of the say the magnitude but in particular uh, in terms of the uh, incentives and maybe also the broader environment the framework in which private in, in uh, private investments can be incentivized to be to, to be part of this and how it could be used to basically multiply uh, the effects of uh, of public investments here and maybe related to that uh, is also the question of uh, uh, crowding out also in, in in other ways. I mean, if, if looking at this, uh, in, I would would be very interested also in understanding capacity questions. Now, um, I think it's it's probably pretty obvious. I mean, it's a problem already here. But then when you look at the massive in infrastructure needs, rebuilding needs, uh, it's also basically just a very fundamental question of material, of craftsmen, um, of just getting it done. Uh, what what are the thoughts there to be prepared for such a, such a massive um, scale? Uh, investment and then actually implementation. 
Yeah, who want, I mean, I, I would have asked the same question and I'm a little bit surprised also following up on what Jörg said, um, what Timothy said that actually everybody talked about this leveraging. Remember we put big pots together, by the way, also the 600 billion at G7 for the anti belt and road initiative, which they decided. Um, it's mostly leveraged, I think. Uh, so there's a big part of it. And usually we use a factor one to six, and it depends on the risks, of course. Uh, so a lot of that money has to come from private actors. Um, and um, and I'm very surprised, um, or, or maybe the EFIs are talking to them, usually they do, uh, how that is actually done. And, and I, I think that's an important point. Um, and, um, and the other issue about corruption I would have, and this builds on this, is that um, the conditionality, uh, which I think you mentioned also, and, and as you said, um, the corruption is, a, is, a, is an issue that when the money is given, so when you get Siemens, for example, to build a new grid, uh, it doesn't solve the, the corruption problem, if there is one, and we also have corruption problems in this country, just to be, be clear. Um, but you need institutional reform. So what you need is you need to have the conditionality also in terms of doing the institutional. If you look at Germany after the Second World War, what the Americans and the Allies did, they basically changed our whole hey, you know, constitution and everything else. So they institutional reforms, which I think are important also to deal with some of these um, corruption issues. So these are these are two thoughts I have. But why is the private uh, uh, Timothy, why is the private sector, or is there anybody there from the private sector in Lugano? Yes, there were people from the private sector, even on the panel that I moderated. Uh, there was a representative CEO of a Swiss business in Ukraine, and she outlined a number of uh, specific, very immediate, uh, but tactical issues that need to be addressed to for them to continue to operate in Ukraine, one of the main being is coordination of orders. I think um, usually during the war times, you have the problem with resources, supply chains, and the capacity that is just, uh, you know, as just we discussed in the question, uh, but, the, re, uh, but the, the businesses are complaining that uh, it's the orders, which is the shortage. So um, that's uh, in some ways optimistic and promising because you can fix the issue of orders. It's a coordination um, problem, which can be addressed by the government or by the local civil military administrations. Uh, of course, the economy is restructuring, um, but the capacity for now is there, there is slack capacity. Of course, when the recovery starts, uh, it's not clear um, there is enough capacity, so I'm pretty sure the Central and Eastern European labor force will be engaged as well. Um, on In terms of bringing the businesses, I think there's one elephant in the room kind of issue, that's war insurance, because the companies can uh, estimate uh, commercial risk, they can't even think about political risks, but uh, it's very difficult to work in an environment where whatever you are doing, you know, can get blown up by a missile. Even if the war is over, I think the risk will continue to be there. So there should be some kind of notion of uh, war, um, you know, war risk insurance. Uh, and if that is not addressed, then it's uh, it's very difficult. It will be very difficult to bring in uh, bring in private investment. And the second one, of course, there's a lot of export credit agencies, you know, where which can provide help with financing uh, for the uh, both supplies and just for the projects. Uh, um, and so that needs to be discussed. So, so I think these two, at least those two instruments, uh, risk of war, risk insurance, and financing uh, would be helpful for the international uh, private capital to come in. And uh, domestically similar issues uh, have to be addressed for the Ukrainian business to invest. Is it only me or your sound disappeared? 
Berlin. Hello, can, can you hear us? You open the window, he can hear us. Okay, go ahead. I, I wasn't sure if I could say something here, but all right. Uh, I, I just wanted to make, I mean, the first thing I had in mind was exactly what Timofey and I also mentioned before that, you know, to get the private sector back, we have to deal both with corruption concerns and of course, safety concerns. And that that's where the insurance part comes in. And I think that's an important part where the, the governments and uh, IFIs need to collaborate with the private sector to, to, to figure out how to share the risks. Um, the other thing I have, I think we should remind ourselves of, is that unfortunately, all of our countries on the other side have also been involved in corrupt behavior. So which is also why we need to think about how we coordinate the donor sides and make sure it's not then in the next step, how we divide up the pie between our companies but we actually let the Ukrainian procurement process be open and fair to everyone and, and not having this as a way of dealing out favors, in, in which case we will just worsen the corruption culture of, of Ukraine and also the businesses that go there. So, I mean, I, I just hope for our own sakes that we take the corruption side on our side of the table uh, also uh, very seriously. Uh, so. Thanks. And and if I can add, I mean it's not only not only corruption; it's also this kind of deals for you know I give you arms, but then you take my companies. Those are the typical things that we've known from international aid for a long time, and that do not lead to the most effective uh, use of the resources. Uh, but it does bring me back, and I want to stress this again, to the independent EU-aligned or authorized uh, agency. Uh, there is uh, everything we've said, and especially that uh, Timothy has said, sort of leads to the conclusion that there needs to be a uh, one authority that has the that has the accountability clearly, but is the channel um, of the of the funding and of the implementation supervision of the conditionality and that the Ukraine has to be very much in the lead there. So, so I, I am, you know, especially after hearing uh, Timothy's um, uh, impressions from, from Lugano, uh, more than ever convinced that uh, the EU better hurry up with this uh, secretariat into making it a real, you know, the agency for the channeling and the long run, the long run uh, um, uh, perspective. Yeah, I think this is a good point. Um, and I didn't mean to say that we shouldn't have an independent agency. So I'm just saying it's, it's not that, and we should certainly call for that from the outside, but knowing how things are inside and um, you know the IEFIs uh, fighting over competences is, is nothing new. They will fight bitterly. Um, in fact, you can argue even in climate issues and in health issues, there's a discussion whether the EFIs or the World Bank and the IMF actually are, are still set up correctly. Uh, actually, there's a UN process from Guterres who's looking at future of global governance. Are we getting these inst global institutions right? Because they're also intermingling in their competences. The IMF is becoming more like the World Bank uh, because of climate and health issues being important in their programs. So um, so we need to push for that. Um, and you need to be very, very careful in setting it up. And the question is always who takes the leadership. So if von der Leyen takes the leadership and does it quickly, um, she better does it in a good way because it can also have a reaction by the others and I don't want to be part of it. You do your thing and we won't be part of it. So it has to be very inclusive. Um, and um, and so you're right. It should be independent and it should be quick. Um, but it's not a, not an easy thing. But none of us is actually involved in this, I guess. So you know, or we can comment from the outside. But I think getting this done is going to be not so uh, not so easy. And I think if you think coordination is difficult on the EFI side or on the government side, G to G, which is always the way these things start it's going to be even more difficult once you have the company side in it, 
because they're competing, they're competing for the same pie, so the coordination, and it's also that, you know, the U.S. government supports U.S. firms. <laughs> We've been having that problem for a long time, and I think having that coordination done is going to be very important. But an agency like that, I would agree, would be able to resolve these issues in an ideal world, and let's hope we move in that direction for the sake of Ukraine. Um, actually, Molly, how are we doing in terms of time? We're over. Okay. Um, so let me let me close it then. Uh, thank you very much uh, for coming here. I think you could continue eating if you like. There's plenty of food left. And let me thank both of our guests um, to Stockholm and especially uh, to somewhere in between Lugano and Kiev. Um, and um, your remark that this shows how difficult infrastructure is in, in, in your part of the world, I think was very pertinent. I don't mean to belittle this, but I had a friend yesterday who took 12 hours to get from Berlin to Stuttgart because of all the strikes. Um, but this is a small problem compared to one you're having. So let me thank you and wish you all the best and uh, let's stay in touch. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Timothy, Toby. Thank you, everyone.